But as soon as our phones can serve as our wallets, cash is gone. There's, why would the U.S. government want cash when they can trace every transaction that you make? It's a much, it's a much superior solution. Hello, welcome to episode 18 of The Bitcoin Game. I'm Rob Mitchell. In today's show, I've got two 20-minute presentations that were given at the Texas Bitcoin Conference earlier this year. First off is a presentation by Jeremy Gardner, who co-founded the College Cryptocurrency Network and is also the Director of Operations at Augur. In his talk, Creating a Sustainable Blockchain Ecosystem, Jeremy gives his views on blockchains now and into the future. Note that there are some rough patches in the audio, especially for questions from the audience. Here's Jeremy. I want you all to imagine you're having a conversation with someone and they tell you for every financial transaction they make, they use PayPal. When was the last time you used PayPal in the store? Probably never. Um, it's not really good for that. Um, this, this is a problem that we have in Bitcoin right now. There's something called Bitcoin maximalism. The notion that there can really only be one blockchain. And that's somewhat inconceivable to me. That we're going to have a single blockchain. I mean, there, there's so many blockchains already in existence, probably over a thousand now. That the notion that we could just have one kind of goes against everything that we've seen so far in this ecosystem. And I think it's going to go against everything we see in the foreseeable future. What I'd like to outline to you is the future that I envision because I believe I've got the unique perspective of flying around to Bitcoin conferences all the time, being a true Bitcoin believer while working the decentralized application space, building on top of Ethereum, working with so many unique individuals and having so many unique perspectives that I believe that often our vision can be clouded because we have a vested at stake in Bitcoin. But the second we become maximalist, we end up losing a lot of the value in this technology. There are four major catalysts for Bitcoin success, and, and Bitcoin is only a small part. First, you have banks, or oh, DAPs, excuse me, decentralized applications, such as Factum, Ethereum, Storage, and Augur. None of these use Bitcoin's blockchain. Well, Factum does, sort of. But each of these offer very unique and powerful set of tools that never existed before. And building on top of Bitcoin's blockchain doesn't really work that well. I'm part of Augur, and decentralized applications are a nightmare to build on top of Bitcoin Core. Uh, Joey Krug, the lead developer on the team, will be speaking at the end of the day today speaking about this, but we tried building on Bitcoin Core, that's how our white paper was written, but it didn't work. Every time we tried to make one change to Bitcoin Core to make it work for prediction markets, which is what Augur is, three things would break. And that's not a sustainable way of building new applications with this technology. And fortunately, Vitalik Buter, and creator of Ethereum, had always been an advisor to our project. He had never suggested that we build on top of Ethereum. We had discussed it, but he never pushed the notion. But we started thinking, wow, maybe Ethereum may be better. And then Blockstream came out, which had announced side chains and allowed you to use Bitcoin on different blockchains. And we're like, now this is something that's workable. And so with, with side chains, Ethereum now, there's now something called a decentralized exchange inside of Ethereum, which doesn't even make it so you don't need uh, side chains. You have Augur. And Augur on Bitcoin Core, it's possible. You could build it. But, it. but it isn't intuitive. It's not scalable. Everything breaks. You know, you want a system that's good for building, not bad. And so I think in the next three months when Ethereum launches to the next five years, we're going to see one of the largest catalysts in Bitcoin's adoption actually being decentralized applications that don't use Bitcoin's blockchain necessarily, perhaps a side chain, but it's not a core tenant of what makes the application. Next, you have banks. Banks, they say, we like the blockchain, we just don't like Bitcoin. 
And so people are like, oh, well, you can't like the blockchain without liking Bitcoin. Wrong. Uh, you can like a different type of blockchain. Or you can do something like Ripple, trusted nodes. And that, oh, d those pictures didn't show up. Oh, but there's a Ripple logo, a Hyperledger logo, EMV. And what we're going to see in the next probably three to five years is Bitcoins using their own sort of blockchains or uh, trusted node-based systems. The reason why they'll do this is because banks like controlling the money that they have. They don't like de total decentralization. They like more efficient s systems. That's why they like the blockchain. They like faster payment rails. Those are great. But they, they don't like not having total control of the money that they have or have printed. Um, so, and credit card companies are the same way. I mean, they have every incentive to use the sort of payment rails of this technology, but the technology itself doesn't actually appeal to them. So people say 2015 is a year of Ripple. I don't know. Uh, there's also a great project called Hyperledger. But I think what we'll see is either individual banks or individual credit card companies either creating their own trusted node systems or coming together like with EMV, chip and dip, and creating kind of uh, a system of nodes that allows them to kind of make their systems more efficient, make things cheaper to do, yet while maintaining total control of, of the systems that they have in place. Because if you're a credit card company, you don't really want a fully de decentralized system. And that's something that the Bitcoin maximalists often miss, is that decentralization is great if you're an individual and you want freedom, but companies aren't individuals, despite what the Supreme Court might say, and they definitely don't care about your freedom. So we have to start looking at the technologies that will actually benefit their agenda, because that will be a catalyst later on for Bitcoin's adoption. But I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. Next, this is probably the most important facet of Bitcoin's adoption. Probably I'm in the 1% of people here that actually believe this is going to happen. But it's going to happen. Uh, if you think the government isn't going to use a trusted node system uh, where they can have like each Federal Reserve serve as a node and they can totally digitalize the US dollar, where they can control every transaction, see every transaction that you've ever made, you're crazy. I mean, that's the greatest thing ever. Like, as much as Bitcoin creates freedom for individuals, it also pr provides this awesome opportunity for government to know everything that you're doing. Because technologies like Ripple allow them to monitor everything you do. So I think in the next four to ten years, we're going to see the US dollar go digital. Obviously, this has to keep in pace with the, the battery life of our phones and other devices. But as soon as our phones can serve as our wallets, cash is gone. There's, why would the US government want cash when they can trace every transaction that you make? It's a, much, it's a much superior solution. So when there was a Reuters exclusive the other day saying that the Federal Reserve was in talks with IBM, I didn't even hesitate to believe it. I, I, I don't think this is anything we'll hear any developments from in even the next year. But five years away, I, I'd be stunned if, if the US dollar wasn't on a path to going digital because the government has every incentive to do this. Now, Bitcoin. Bitcoin will play a role in all this because as our lives become digitalized, as money becomes digitalized, as we're used to using the, these sort of digital currencies every day in our life, it becomes a lot more fathomable that someone could look at something like Bitcoin and be like, that makes sense. Right now, 99.9% .9 of people look at Bitcoin and they're like, that's stupid. But, or I don't get it. Or what is it? But if the currency they already use is digital, if their, their cash is digital, if the way we transact money is on our cell phones, kind of the way Bitcoin is now, but 5, 10, 15, 30 years down the road, then it's fathomable. And I think there will be a place for Bitcoin in the meantime as a digital goal, because it's going to be a secondary digital asset. This thing that, much like gold, 
you, it's decentralized, you own it, nobody else can hold it, nobody else can, can control it. But it's not going to be a transactional currency. By my estimates, for it to reach any level of transactional currency, uh, it's going to have to reach a $500 billion market capitalization, which is the size of daily Forex trading. Um, that's a long ways away. Um, I think as we go digital, Bitcoin becomes a digital gold, then you can start to see the stability in the system that you need for people to adopt this technology. And then, and only then, once people are comfortable with this tech, there's stability in the market capitalization, there's not a lot of fluctuation in price, then we may, may have an opportunity with this tech, and it's not soon. Um, but, it, but it could happen, because what's gonna happen is you can have some Snowden-like revelations that really just serve as a catalyst for the mass exodus from Fed coin, US dollar coin, to a autonomous system, a system that is not run by any government. Now that, that is really important. In the meantime, we need to build a killer app that may not necessarily use Bitcoin, that can start to move that cap market capitalization upwards. Now, I'll actually get to that in a second. Uh, but first I'd like to take questions because then I'm just gonna outline what it what it takes for us to get to the next step of Bitcoin's adoption. So, any questions? The U.S. government can do what it wants. Um, I'm, I'm not terribly concerned about them being able to commit crimes, whether or not there's cash. Um, I think the notion that they can wash the flow of money at all times, it, 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 it can be challenging even for the government right now because there are all these different sorts of ways of moving money. I think that moving to digital currency and eliminating cash, which is the, which is the largest black market good there is, um, would be a really powerful move for them. And it would make their lives easier. No more printing money. It's just it's, it's saving money. Tom? So, before, um, <laughs> before the Bitcoin was introduced, there was a lot of people that were like, oh, you know, So Tone's question was, do you think like in Ecuador where they did go digital with their currency, um, will the US dollar, or will, will Bitcoin be criminalized in a place like the United States? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I don't think so. Um, I think we, if that was going to happen, that was going to happen a year ago or a year and a half ago. I think what we have now is uh, a bureaucrats that are fairly well informed about this technology that may be cautious about it, but they're cautiously optimistic. And there, there are uh, politicians, I mean, Steve Stockman, who's here today. I mean, I know he just retired, but they're, they're Jared Paulus, who's a Democrat, congressman from Colorado. He said he will defund any federal agency that attacks Bitcoin. Um, you know, we have, we have our defenders, and I believe that when anyone is well-educated about this technology, they see the good that can come from it. Yes, as we go towards our own digital currency, that is a risk, but I, I don't think it's highly probable because the understanding of Bitcoin is great enough that they understand that you, you can say it's illegal, but what can you do to stop it? So I, I don't see a trend towards criminalization coming as a result of US dollar coin. Just keep in mind, US dollar coin will affect 99.9% .9 of Americans, whereas Bitcoin only affects 0.1. Uh, now that may change obviously over time. Well, I'll actually get to that in just a second. It, 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 but 
very importantly, it's killer applications, um, the economic viability of Bitcoin be, becoming more apparent to a broader audience that want to adopt it. Hedge funds may be putting 0.5% of their funds in Bitcoin. You know, having this secondary digital asset is very important. But I'll get to that in just a second. If there are no other questions, questions? Excellent. So then let's talk about that. Killer applications. So Bitcoin fundamentally is this incredible, or even right now, this incredibly powerful uh, financial instrument for people in the developing world. It's a killer remittance app if you can use it. Um, it's, it's a better store value than the Argentine peso, as I'm sure you've all heard dozens of times, and elsewhere in the world as well, any country that's experienced hyperinflation, Zimbabwe. Um, but those countries are not going to increase the value of Bitcoin exponentially. You need to have applications that work in the developing world that inspire people to use Bitcoin. Now, what we have here are, are two applications in, in total conflict of interest. I'm involved with every single one of these companies. But that's because I really think these are the best companies in the space. Not, not, I mean, I'm not saying this out of bias. But you have Zendit and you have Abra. These are remittance companies where the consumer never knows they're using Bitcoin. They just know they're having cheaper, faster, more efficient, and more secure remittances to their families back home. They can actually now send sums of money that are less than $100 and have it make sense. Because MoneyGram and Western Union, Union to most countries have a $10 fee. Um, give me one second. So it's incredibly important that you have tools like this where people are using Bitcoin, not know they're using it, but they're just using the blockchain to make their lives easier, faster, and better. Bitwage, for the Bitcoiners out there, you can get paid in Bitcoin every week, not even think about buying it. And lastly, you've got Augur where you have prediction markets and literally it takes this multi-trillion dollar industry that's betting of all forms from stock markets to derivatives to just general betting and putting it on the blockchain, making it easy to access for anyone in the world to use. And that's incredibly powerful because it's taking something that we all do, want to do, and can't do online right now. And these are the sort of tools that will let, allow Bitcoin to thrive. But a lot of these tools don't use Bitcoin necessarily. And that's why we have to end the maximalism and embrace the new technologies in this space. Thank you. Hey, podcast listeners. I'm Carrie, and I'm here to tell you about something really powerful that's happening. Nepal recently suffered a tragic earthquake. Thousands of lives were lost, and people around the world are wanting to help. Fortunately, Red Cross has opened a Bitcoin wallet with Change Tip and is now accepting Bitcoin donations. In just a matter of days, thousands of dollars have poured into this account, turning Bitcoins into food and supplies for those in need. With Change Tip, we can send Bitcoins through Twitter and use our social platforms to build momentum towards giving. We can give any amount, no matter how small, and together, it really adds up. So to open an account, go to changetip.com. There you can buy Bitcoins or transfer from your Bitcoin wallet. Start giving, and if you want, redirect the gifts people give you to go to Red Cross. Let's use these amazing tools we've created to pull each other up and show the world the value of Bitcoin through generosity. Today's magic word is future. F-U-T-U-R-E. Use this magic word to claim your share of this week's listener distribution of LTB coin on letstalkbitcoin.com. Now for our second presentation, we turn to the experienced market trader and economist Adam Hayes, who presents... What factors give cryptocurrencies their value? An empirical analysis. Here's Adam. Hello. So my talk today is actually going to cover three research papers that I've done, the first of which appears in the proceedings to this conference. And a little bit about me. I was a derivatives trader and worked in the derivatives markets for over 15 years. 
and I was an early Bitcoin adopter. So naturally, when I looked to evaluate value formation in Bitcoin, I approached it from the point of view of a financial asset. But there was a lot of noise in the price between Bitcoins and dollars. And as you all know, the volatility of the price over the past few years has been enormous. And that makes doing any sort of meaningful data analysis to extract these drivers of value very, very difficult. But fortunately, there's this whole universe of altcoins that have relatively active and fairly liquid markets that trade against Bitcoin and are denominated in Bitcoin. So we strip out the dollar, and we're looking now at a universe of only Bitcoin denominated space. And here, all that noise is removed and the price volatility is much lower. Uh, for example, one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin, always, in this space. So what do I mean by value? So the market price at any point in time is dictated by fluctuations in supply and demand and the imbalances that are seen in the market. Value is a center of gravity around which prices tend to fluctuate. And it's kind of a theoretical value. The market price can deviate from that expected value for long periods of time. And it may never converge to that value. So just to get that out of the way, because it's always asked. So looking at all these cryptocurrencies that have a common lineage to Bitcoin, there's a rich data set of some common attributes that they all have. And by examining differences in the values of these attributes of all these different cryptocurrencies, I was able to run a multiple regression analysis that determined which of these matter in relative price formation and which of them didn't. Going into it, I thought all of them could feasibly matter. The block reward is the number of coins found per block. The block time is how many minutes or seconds between blocks and so forth. Those are all built in. There's also observed variables that we can only see by looking at the market, such as the price and the aggregate hashing power, which manifests itself indirectly through the difficulty of mining. So looked at 66 different cryptocurrencies that were actively traded and ran a multiple regression that had an R-square of 84.4. This means that almost 85% of relative value formation is explained by the following. Mining difficulty is positively correlated to value. The more hashing power that's in there, the greater the difficulty, the more valuable a coin is. The more people mining a coin, the more valuable it is, is kind of intuitive. The rate of unit formation is negatively correlated to value. This means that if I have a block reward of 10,000 for some altcoin, it's going to be a lot less valuable per unit than something that's one one hundredth of a coin. And uh, the other one that mattered was script is more valuable than SHA coins, all else equal. It's a more rigorous mining algorithm. It means that it's harder to find those coins with a harder algorithm. Money supply did not matter, and this surprised me. It didn't matter that Bitcoin has 21 million coins ever to be, or a pure coin has an infinite amount, or some coins only have 42, for example. That was irrelevant, and what was also irrelevant in the statistical analysis was how long the coin has been around. It didn't matter if it was four or five years, or one or two years. So the main drivers of cryptocurrency relative value formation are taking place at the margin and have to do with the production of them and the relative differences in how many units are produced through a given amount of mining effort. So starting to look less like something like a currency and more that's something akin to commodity production. So just it's important to bring up now that Bitcoin is the stable equilibrium for cryptocurrencies, meaning that it's the most widely accepted by people in the marketplace. It has the largest mining network. If you want to transact meaningfully in an economic way with cryptocurrencies, you need to get Bitcoins. And if that means by buying them, by mining them directly or indirectly through altcoins, it doesn't matter that it may be technically inferior to some other altcoins. It's very hard to dislodge that sta stable equilibrium. For example, VHS over Betamax and QWERTY keyboards and internal combustion engines are all examples of this in real life. So this equation tells you how many Bitcoins a miner can expect to earn per day for one terahash of mining power. And we're just going to use a standard of one terahash just to make it easy. Bitcoins per day is a function of the block reward, the mining power, and the difficulty. And that's it. Those other numbers are constants that scale it up for days. 
and uh, take the maximum difficulty, uh, theoretical difficulty, and scale it down with 256-bit encryption. That's why you see 2 to the 32. But the variables there, and we're pegging the one terahash, and the block reward we know is 25, is the difficulty. So because that if you want to spend cryptocurrencies to transact, you need bitcoins, at least right now. So if a miner can produce effectively more bitcoins a day by mining for some old coin and then exchanging them in the market, they will do that versus mining for bitcoin directly. And if not, they will mine for bitcoin directly. Because again, value formation on this level is only formed by production. So it's the producers who matter. Let's take an example. A rig that mines one bitcoin a day can alternatively produce 33,000 of some hypothetical XYZ coin a day. And if the market bid on, a, let's say, Cryptsy or a similar exchange is 3,996 Satoshi, you can sell those and get effectively 32% more Bitcoin a day than by mining Bitcoin. But these opportunities are very short-lived because as people see this opportunity, they go in, produce these coins, sell them in the market, and keep selling them until the equilibrium price is reached. In this case, it would be 3,030 Satoshi. But another thing's at work. Additional mining power brought into these small altcoins will increase the difficulty, which will make it harder and harder to find them, making that profit opportunity less and less. So what's the implication? Well, at the fundamental level, altcoins will tend to fall over time in value relative to Bitcoin. And furthermore, at specific moments, such as when Bitcoin's difficulty increases, we should see this effect happen more uh, pronounced because if I can mine one Bitcoin a day or 33,000 XYZ a day and it's 30, 30 Satoshi versus one Bitcoin, I'm indifferent. But if the difficulty of Bitcoin mining increases and I can only find 0.9 a day, that makes the 30, 30 Satoshi price attractive again because that's 10% more Bitcoins effectively. So if we see Bitcoin difficulty increases, we should see altcoins get pushed down even more so. We also have the problem of overshooting, which has to do with the market price being continuous and the difficulty adjustments being incremental. And there's also a time lag with confirmations. Some of these altcoins take a long time to go from mining to a wallet to an exchange and then trade. So here's just some examples of real world market data of some of the most popularly traded altcoins in the last six months. And they're all down significantly. Here's six more. So going back to my first question that I wanted to figure out, what is the underlying value of Bitcoin in dollars? But now looking at it from this new perspective, from a cost of production perspective, I have to identify, well, what is the cost for producing Bitcoins? And that, as everyone knows, is the cost of electricity. So right now, you have to pay for electricity in dollars, but you produce Bitcoins that are in Bitcoin. And according to economic theory, in a competitive production market, marginal cost is going to equal marginal uh, product, which is going to equal selling price. Because our cost term is in dollars per gigahash per day, and our product is in bitcoins per gigahash per day, if we divide cost by the product, we're dividing equivalents, that's just one, but we'd get scaled up to put it back into dollars per bitcoin space. Let's do a little example. Let's say the average world electricity cost is 11 and a half cents per kilowatt hour. And the average mining efficiency on the Bitcoin network right now is a little under one uh, watt per gigahash second, which is the same as a joule per gigahash. And we already saw that Bitcoins per day with one terahash, you'd expect to find a little more than one hundredth of a Bitcoin a day. Divide the marginal cost by the marginal product, and you get a number that's very close to the market price of Bitcoin. If you do the math yourself, you'll see there's a small rounding error. I think it's off by like 11 cents because I rounded the denominator. But the point is, is that this, for looking at it not like money, not like a financial asset, but as a, a commodity produced in a competitive market, using economic theory that way, you actually get a very good and justifiable uh, beginnings of understanding value. 
So these, there's implications if this is true. So as mining becomes more energy efficient, and it has, by leaps and bounds, the amount of technological progress in mining hardware has gone faster than any other, you know, they, they compared it to the growth of the internet and the dot com, they say that this has gone even faster. As mining efficiency increases, it's going to put downward pressure on the market price of Bitcoin in dollars because lower and lower cost producers will exist that can be profitable at prices of 180, 150, 140 dollars, and they can still continue to earn a profit, while those that are stuck around now, 243 dollars on the margin, would effectively be uh, operating at a loss, so they would stop. Difficulty adjustments counteract this tendency, however. So unlike a traditional commodity where supply can be augmented or, or decreased in order to accommodate changes in demand, bitcoins are always produced at one block every 10 minutes. It's the difficulty that acts as an elasticity in a certain way that will go up and down, making the cost of production higher as the difficulty increases. When the block reward is halved, it will actually do this to a severe extent. It will double the cost of production overnight, presumably. So these are just objective, quantifiable valuation insights. And bitcoins and altcoins obviously possess additional subjective values as well that are very hard to identify and quantify. But people are speculating. Miners are hoarding. This model of production assumes that people are mining to produce. They're producing to sell. That's not true. Some miners keep all or some of their, of their product. There's community and brand loyalty. For example, Dogecoin has a huge loyalty behind it, even though fundamentally it's fairly worthless based upon these, this mathematics. And there's value in the unique features of cryptocurrencies, such as the decentralized nature, that it's anonymous, that it's fairly secure, and so on. So if it's a commodity with an exchange value, it should also have a use value. And I, I don't want to use these classical political economy terms loosely, but what I mean is that if you're going to have mining effort in order to find this commodity, there must be a use for it. And the use is actually the mining work itself. So as we know, mining has a dual purpose. It finds new Bitcoins, but it also verifies transactions and secures the blockchain. And this is extremely valuable because it prevents things like double spend, which would render it useless as, as a currency or as a means of exchange. So the Bitcoin network is a giant validation engine. You can look at it as a payments network, but it's a giant validation engine. And mining is a misnomer. It's validation work. So up until recently, the validation work has been verifying internal Bitcoin transactions between wallets. And while that is of some value, what's of more value is when Bitcoin 2.0 applications become more prevalent and you can now embed and validate external transactions in the Bitcoin blockchain through mining effort. So imagine a case where you can IPO shares onto the blockchain or settle financial transactions onto the blockchain. These things have enormous value in our real economy. And if they're occurring not at stock exchanges and through investment banks, but on the blockchain, mining and miners are going to want to be paid a value commensurate to the value of this validation work. And that is going to be the future value, I believe, of Bitcoin. And that's where you're going to see the subjective piece become more interesting. And, uh, and I think that's where a lot more research is going to be headed. Um, one thing I'll leave you with then is Bitcoin's might not be money then. They might have been intended to be money, but that's not how they're behaving. And they might not even be a commodity. In fact, I think one way to think about Bitcoins is that they are tokens earned for the uh, reward for doing verification and validation work. And I'll leave you guys with that. I have a couple minutes if anyone has any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, bringing these uh, additional factors to my uh, attention and to our, our attention. I'm a coin designer, so I made decisions uh, a few months ago as the specifications of a coin that I thought would lead to maximum value. And some of these have, some of your points have confirmed my decisions. Over the past 18 months in Bitcoin, Bitcoin Talk Forum, 
independently, two researchers there proposed evaluation models. And I wondered if you had looked at those. So the idea was uh, Metcalf's law for networks that the network is, the value of the network is proportional to the square number of nodes. So the analogy was that the users or the number of transactions was indicative of the number of nodes in the Bitcoin network. And they found a very strong correlation between two data series and the price of Bitcoin over the life of Bitcoin. The, the first was the quantity of transactions reported by uh, blockchain info excluding uh, popular addresses. And the second was the number of wallets also reported by uh -huh. blockchain info. There was a very strong correlation between a quantity of transactions and the number of wallets proportional to the square of those. So as an altcoin designer, my objective to maximize the value of the altcoin would be to maximize the number of transactions and the number of users. Your thoughts? Well, transaction data is, is hard to pin down because you don't know what is a real economic transaction and presumably those are the transactions that will be meaningful for value. If someone's transferring whatever they mined in their day from their mining wallet to their cold storage wallet and then take it off to put it onto a cryptocurrency exchange, that might look like a lot of volume when in fact there's not any meaningful transactions. That's why I brought up the point that in order to transact in the real world, right now you need to convert into Bitcoin. To a smaller extent, Litecoin and Dogecoin, but not really. This is the Texas Bitcoin conference. It's not the altcoin conference, for example. And that, again, is just a product of path dependency. Uh, you can make a far superior altcoin technologically with features that are perceived subjectively as valuable. However, it is very hard to dislodge that stable equilibrium once it's been established. Um, I have a quick question. Have you uh, considered the tax benefit obtained um, in the, for the valuation of a Bitcoin? I, I'm not a tax advisor, but I, I don't know if classifying it as a produced commodity versus a financial asset would have tax implications. You should speak with the, um, the gentleman that gave the speech on taxes because, earlier. Because what I, what I, what the, this is an intuitive thing that I've had for a long time, is that obviously the expense of producing my electricity is tax deductible and the benefit know. is not. Uh, this is beyond my realm of expertise, but uh, I would imagine that there might be a difference. I just don't know what it would be. Um, would it be a fair conclusion um, from this research to say that uh, there is a tendency for the rate of profit for mining Bitcoin to fall uh, given the, the increase in difficulty and the, the, the limitations built into Bitcoin as a protocol itself? Well, I want to be very careful in identifying a rate of profit versus the price or the value. The rate of profit in Bitcoin is hard to pin down because the rate of profit is the own return of one terahash of mining power. So per day, your profit is a little over a hundredth of a Bitcoin a day of profit. If you increase your electrical efficiency, you're still going to produce with one terahash of mining power. However, when the difficulty changes, that will affect how many you find per day given that same amount of power. So it's, it's hard to say what is a rate of profit uh, in, a, in a Bitcoin internal sense. So uh, would it then be a, another reasonable conclusion to say that uh, at the very least it will drive miners to seek constantly places to run mining operations that, where the electricity costs are lower. Yes. And, and you see that already where there's big mining warehouses in places like Iceland that where it's very cheap geothermal electricity. But what matters is the regulating values are the average across the network. Because you're going to have people producing on the margin, you're going to have people producing below the margin. The people that are producing at a very high energy efficiency at this point in time are earning economic rent. So they're earning excess profits. Over time, as the people that are producing on the margin get booted out by the market essentially, then we will see the price start to converge. Now there's going to be a seesaw between increasing energy efficiency, which is going to put a negative pressure on the dollar price, and the halving of the block reward and increases in difficulty, which will tend to counteract that. And I don't know which will win out. Thank you. All right. I have time for one more question, I've been told. 
Um, so I guess this goes into another question that was already raised. Um, so how would um, the government regulation are affecting this? Because like it was said, you don't know how many coins are moving from one wallet to another. And there are a lot of these statistics just get skewed every six months due to differences in government regulations. Right, and that's why the beginning of the analysis stripped away the, the dollar, euro, yen, yuan price. It was looking at internal Bitcoin economy, let's call it only, where Bitcoin was the base currency. And by doing so, it didn't matter whether or not the price of Bitcoin rose or fell, because one Bitcoin would equal one Bitcoin. Well, thank you very much. Um, the papers are available for you to read. The other two, if you're interested, just find me and I'll give you the links. Thank you. Thanks for listening to episode 18 of The Bitcoin Game. Please let me know you listened by following or tweeting to The BTC Game on Twitter or by commenting on this episode's page on letstalkbitcoin.com. You can find a listing of all episodes of The Bitcoin Game by going to thebitcoingame.com. See you next time. Bank X shares, made safe coin, peer coin, fight coin, name coin, fair coin, Monero, YB coin, black coin, infinite coin, counterpart, Mona coin, vert coin, supernet, new shares, fuel coin, NEM, pay coin, Veracoin, Bitcoin dark, D note, instant dex, swarm, get gems, rimbit, coino USD, arch coin, mega coin, shadow cash, Cash, Ethercoin, Ether Dark Coin, Solar Farm, Solar Farm. Solar Farm.